Welcome to History of the Middle East with Dr. Vorovkin. Today we'll talk about one of the most important events that affected Ottoman Empire and also European history, and that is the Russian-Turkish War. So, it's a very, very long topic. It has all kinds of uh, implications in international relations, in domestic affairs, in religious affairs. Uh, so, we're going to try to be as concise as possible. The first item would be the prologue, or so the beginning. The, the background, what actually had led to this war. And in terms of international relations, one of the most important antecedents is the Crimean War. So just to remind you briefly, Crimean War is the one fought in 1854-55, which is an invasion by British and French expeditionary forces to Crimea, a Russian-held territory on the Black Sea. Uh, it started when the Russians defeated the Turkish fleet, the British and the French came in to help the Turks, uh, and then there was a siege of Sebastopol, uh, and there was a long protracted very difficult war for both sides. In the end, Sebastopol was taken and Russia was defeated. Uh, and the result was a treaty that, of Paris that guaranteed, as that's important for the coming war, guaranteed territorial integrity of the Ottoman Empire, which made it pretty much impossible for Russia to start any war with the Turks anymore because the territorial integrity was guaranteed by uh, Britain, France, and Austria three major uh, powers. Uh, now, also, Russia lost the capacity to have a, a fleet, and that's exactly what the British wanted, because they had their plans set on Egypt and the Suez Canal, and they did all of those. They built the canal, they seized Egypt, etc., etc., but that takes us away from the immediate background. Now, the second important thing it, it, leading up to the war is, you recall, the Tanzimat reforms proclaimed uh, equality of Muslims and Christians, which was a good thing. But, as it turned out, that was a problem, because a lot of Muslims didn't like it. And instead of making relations better w w between the Christians and the Muslims, it actually made it worse, because there was much more heightened pressure between them. Moreover, the reform did grant uh, equality, but there was one caveat, which means one sort of exclusion from it, which means that in the court of law, uh, the, if there is a testimony of a Christian against a Muslim, it wouldn't count. In other words, it gave a privileged position to the Muslims, and, and that's okay, but uh, if it is a fair court, but in cases where the Muslims were a minority, a complete minority, such as in Bulgaria or Serbia or any one of the Balkan countries, it actually led to a situation where Muslims uh, abused their privileged position and could get free. Uh, get, could get away free from all kinds of offenses such as theft or whatever. And that ignited even more confrontation between the Christians and the Muslims than, than was the case before this supposed equality. So one thing where this problem led to a rebellion is 1860. Uh, it's called the Crisis of Lebanon. Uh, basically, it was a normal sort of uprising of peasants against landlords, Christian peasants, Christian landlords. It wouldn't have been a big deal. Uh, Lebanon, as you know, is half Christian, half Muslim. But what happened is that in the south of Lebanon, there are the Druze. The Druze think they're Muslim, but the Muslims don't think they are Muslim because they're Druze, etc., etc. They, they pledge allegiance to Hafid, this uh, crazy... Uh, Sultan from the Fatimi period. Anyway, the Druze sided with the uh, landlords. And then it turned into a religious war because there was a, a massacre of the Lebanese Christian peasants by the Druze. So this is what is important about it. It's, it's a conflict that is a class conflict and nobody would have noticed it had it stayed class conflict between peasants and landlords. But when the, group, the Druze massacred the Muslims, I'm sorry, the Christians, it turned into a religious conflict. And that means the great powers interfered, and they said, wait a second, we're not going to allow you to massacre the Christians. And this is when the French required of the Ottomans to recognize that they are going to be the protectors of Christians in Lebanon. And that stayed up to almost the present times.
Now, but that was not even the end of the story. That led the uh, conflict between Christians and Muslims to erupt in Syria. Uh, and the Muslims in Syria, hearing about this trouble in Lebanon, rose against the Syrian Christians. Uh, and this was a big, big deal, because uh, according to the mi minor uh, estimates, is 5,000 of Christians in Damascus were massacred, but some other reports talk about as big as 25,000 killed. Moreover, the American consul and the Dutch consul were killed as well in these massacres in Damascus, which led to absolutely international outcry against the uh, Ottoman Empire uh, and the massacres of the Christians. This created the situation that the great powers were beginning to think maybe they should interfere militarily to stop uh, massacres of Christians. Uh, now, uh, we're going back to the Balkans, and the trouble there started five years later, which is in uh, 1875. In 1875, uh, there was a rebellion in Herzegovina, uh, which is Bosnia-Herzegovina. It's a territory that today is an independent country, uh, and it's right next to Montenegro. Uh, these are Orthodox Christians, and the reason they rebelled was because uh, in, uh, in 1875 there was a, um, a drought in the Ottoman Empire and they just ran out of money. In fact, uh, the Ottoman Empire declared its bankruptcy. Because they were bankrupt and because there was a drought, they raised taxes. Uh, and the, the drought was in Anatolia, but it was not in the Balkan area. Therefore, the Christian population felt that they were squeezed with higher taxes to pay for the drought of the Turks, which is in Anatolia. And of course, they didn't like the increased uh, taxes, and they rebelled. So this is one of the le one of the rebellions that would lead to uh, this international war. Okay, so rebellion in, in Bosnia, I'm sorry, yeah, in, in, in Herzegovina. Um, then in the spring of 76, and that is the one, the event that really read, led to war, the uh, uprising in Herzegovina is joined by the uprising in Bulgaria. Uh, these, are, uh, these are also Christians, and they're almost identical in their language and culture. It's just we call them Bulgaria because they are... Uh, in that geographical area, but they could understand each other in terms of their dialects. I mean, I've been to uh, uh, Bulgaria just for the for the New Year's Eve this year, and I could understand anything. I've never studied Bulgarian, so it's very very close to Serbian and to Russian. Uh, the, the the dialects are different, but you could understand the gist of it quite well. I'm sure local people would understand each other even better. Uh, so. Anyway, uh, so uh, Bulgarian uh, uh, rebellion is different because here you have a situation of the Muslims being massacred. So the, the, the Bulgarian rebels, they vent their frustration and they kill Muslims who really were not guilty of anything. They were kind of neighbors and they got along just fine for centuries and now the frustrations are rising up and they do massacre uh, the, um, the 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 uh, Muslim uh, peasants, as a result of which the Turkish Empire, the Turkish authorities, they do not use regular troops. And this is their biggest mistake, but because that's what galvanizes the situation to uh, provoke great powers. They use the volunteer Muslim detachments that are called Bashi Buzuks. And I'm going to ask you in the test, who are the Bashi Buzuks? Bashi Buzuks are volunteer Turkish Muslim detachments whose job is to suppress the uprising, but in fact, what they do is massacre the Christians. So they kind of respond to massacre with counter-massacre. Uh, and they just burn and kill and... Um, According to Lord Kinross, who wrote a bunch of reports uh, to England about the situation on the ground, and I quote, their orgy of slaughter and ar arson culminated in the village of Batak. And in the village of Batak, they locked up 5,000 local residents, women and children, uh, and men, of course, and just burned them there alive. 
and this was an outcry of protest in Europe, in, in England, uh, and uh, even to a point of a parliamentary debate where the le leader of the position, uh, Gladstone, accused the Prime Minister Disraeli of complicity in murder of the Christians by supporting the Ottoman Empire. So it was a big deal, uh, this uh, tragedy in the village of Batak. Uh, now, a result of the, this brings us one more step closer to the war. Uh, Russian public opinion was inflamed too, uh, and Dostoevsky, a great Russian writer and very, very religious and very orthodox, called on Russia to go for a liberation of the Orthodox Christians from the Turkish rule. Uh, the westernizes, the other side, liberal pro-western side of Russian public opinion, led by another great famous Russian writer, Turgenev, uh, also called for the liberation of Bulgaria, but not because of their orthodoxy, but because of human and compassion uh, with those suffering uh, peasants who were slaughtered by the Turks. Um, so there were there were all kinds of uh, rallies in Russia and in England uh, and in France uh, about the situation in the Balkans, and everybody understood you have to do something because it just cannot go on like this. Uh, so the next step is uh, in June uh, 76, uh, 30th of June to be precise, and this is where uh, Serbia. Uh, a small country that is de facto independent, de jure it is still a part of the Ottoman Empire, but it is declaring a war on the Ottoman Empire, even though uh, it's technically a part of Ottoman Empire. Uh, but uh, they do declare war and join the Bulgarian uh, rebellion. And it is at this moment there's a very important historical meeting between the Emperor of the um, Austria-Hungary, uh, Emperor Franz Josef and the Emperor of the Russian Empire, Alexander II. So the two emperors meet uh, and they do sign an agreement which is extremely important because as you will see it would be kind of connected to World War I. The agreement is the that Austria-Hungary stays out of the conflict if there is a war in the Balkans. But as a, as a as a reward for staying out of it, they will get Bosnia-Herzegovina for temporary administration, and it's crucial, it's going to be temporary administration, not annexation. Uh, so it would be uh, administered by the Austro-Hungarians and they would not interfere in the war. In other words, they got a province doing nothing. Russia would, would, would actually spend, uh, uh, you know, a war and thousands and thousands, more than several tens of thousands of Russian soldiers would die in that war and, and they would get pretty much no territorial gains, very few, uh, but then the you know, liberation of uh, Bulgaria and Serbia from the Turks. The Ottomans got a province doing absolutely not. I'm sorry, the Austrians got a province doing nothing at all. In any case, uh, the escalation goes further and in October 76, Serbia asks for a truce because the Turkish troops are overrunning uh, small Serbia. It cannot withhold on its own. Uh, but the Ottomans refuse and continue the offensive. Now, this, this next several steps show that Russia was not in a hurry to go to war. They did all kinds of things to try to resolve the situation without the war, but um, it didn't work out. So, on October 31, 1876, Russia issues an ultimatum to the Ottoman Empire uh, to stop the offensive against Serbia and to sign the truce, or else Russia would go to war. And the Ottomans ex accept. So they, they, they really didn't want to go to war with Russia and they accepted it. And that leads to another important event, which is December uh, 1876, an international conference in Constantinople. Now, the important thing about that conference is it, it is important because the Ottomans were not invited to this conference. Can you imagine this? They, Great powers meet in Constantinople, in the capital of the Ottoman Empire, and they don't even invite the Turks to participate, which is really a flagrant declaration that the great powers are great powers, and you, 
the Ottomans should do what you're told by the great powers. They would do the same thing to Germany after World War I by not inviting them to the Treaty of Versailles to, to dictating the, the conditions of the Germans. And they were so upset and so angry that they decided to go at it again, and that's World War II. In any case, uh, this is a precedent when the great powers feel that they're superior and they can tell the Ottomans what they should do. Uh, and they do uh, decide that uh, the Turks should uh, recognize independence of Serbia. Now, if the Turks have done it, maybe there wouldn't have been a war, but they didn't. They refused. Instead, they proclaimed what you already know about, a constitution of 1876, uh, and, and by basically saying to the Allies, now, we now have equality between uh, all our uh, parts, and therefore, there's no need for any war. Uh, and it is now 16 minutes. I'm going to pause. That will be part one, and we will uh, invite other people to clap and uh, sign up for uh, Middle Eastern history with Dr. Brofkin, and then we'll continue.